In all of mathematics, there are perhaps no numbers more celebrated than pi, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, and the number e, whose definition is a little bit more complicated, and that will be relevant later in this video. Indeed, e, sometimes called Euler's number, is another one of the stars among the cast of irrational numbers. Like all irrational numbers, it is characterized, among other things, by the fact that its decimal expansion goes on and on infinitely without ever repeating or terminating. These are the first handful of digits of E. This notation, by the way, for the number, was introduced by our boy Jacob Bernoulli in 1683. It came up when Jacob was investigating compound interest, and we will come back to that later. Since the decimal expansions of irrational numbers just go on and on, one of the interesting topics you can look at with regard to these numbers is methods of approximating them. And just like pi, e has many interesting approximations. This fraction is a pretty good approximation of e. In fact, it's correct to nine decimal places. That means it's accurate all the way up to right there. Another cute approximation of e looks like this. This approximation for e is accurate to six decimal places. If we want to get really cute, we can even use pi to approximate e. Indeed, e is approximately pi to the power of four plus pi to the power of five to the power of one over six. This approximation of e is good for seven decimal places. These are all fine approximations, but I want to show you what might be the coolest approximation for E, and it's a little bit more accurate than these ones. Let me take you back to the month of August in the year 2004. Back then, and indeed for some time after, mathematician Eric Friedman had a monthly blog of sorts where he would challenge people to solve some problem in recreational mathematics. And in this month, as the temperatures began to fall and the leaves turned beautiful hues of gold and red, Eric posed a simple challenge. The challenge was to approximate E using only the first n digits, and the permitted symbols or mathematical operations were addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, grouping, a decimal point, and the caret or exponents. This was written in plain text, which is why I write it this way. So for example, for n equals one, we're only allowed to use the first digit, which is one, to approximate e. In this case, the best we can do is just the number one. This approximation of e is accurate to zero decimal places. However, if n is equal to two, then we can use the first two digits, both one and two. In this case, Case, we can get a more accurate approximation using one plus two, that's three. Remember the E is about 2.7 and change, although still this is accurate to zero decimal places. Finally, when N equals three, and we can use digits one, two, and three for our approximation, we're able to get a bit closer. Simply doing three minus point two minus point one gives us an approximation of 2.7, which isn't bad. That's accurate to one or two decimal places, depending on if you count the two or if you're just looking at the digits after the decimal point. Of course, this goes on and on. There are all sorts of approximations we could come up with with the first one, two, three, four, five digits. Eventually though, we come to n equals nine, where the complexity and ability is much greater. We could do a lot with nine digits, but man, there's a lot we could do with nine digits. Since we've been excluding zero from this discussion, n equals nine is all of the available digits. Of course, if you take issue with the use of these two zeros in the n equals three approximation, you're more than welcome to write it like this, three minus 0.2 minus 0.1. Regardless though, this is what we might call a pan-digital approximation because it uses all of the available digits. For example, here's a pan-digital approximation approximation of the number three. And this is a pretty good approximation. And it uses all of the digits from zero, if you want to count that, all the way up through nine. But how could we use the digits one through nine to approximate E? Well, in response to Eric Friedman's challenge, a fella named Richard Sabe came in with an incredible pan-digital approximation. Richard Sabe said, hey, check this out. One plus nine to the negative four to the seven times 
times 6, all to the power of 3 to the power of 2 to the power of 85. This is a pan-digital approximation of E, which is astonishingly accurate. The best approximation we've seen so far was this one, which was accurate to 9 places after the decimal point. But Richard Sabe's pan-digital approximation of E is accurate to 18 septillion, 457 sextillion, 734 quintillion, 525 quadrillion, 360 trillion, 901 billion, 453 million, 873,005. 570 decimal places. Now, for all of the previous approximations, it would be very easy to just punch them into a calculator and verify how accurate they are as approximations for E. But how on earth could we be sure that this is anything close to E? There's no way we're plugging this into a calculator. Just 2 to the power of 85 over here? That's a number that's 26 digits long. So there's no way your run-of-the-mill calculator is going to raise 3 to the power of that exponent. I tried it on my famously powerful Kawai calculator and it did not work. I'm just grateful the thing didn't explode. Well, to understand that this is a very good approximation of E without doing the computations, you need only understand how unsurprising this approximation really is. And that all comes back to the definition of E, which stems from compound interest. So let's define E for anyone who doesn't know. Consider a savings account with $1 that earns 100% interest per year. Now with interest, there's this thing called compounding, which is basically how frequently interest is calculated over a given time period. Let's call the number of times interest is compounded n. So in the most simple case where n is equal to 1 and the interest is compounded once per year, then after one year the amount in the savings account looks like this. There's that original $1, and then it's getting multiplied by 1, that just preserves that original amount, 1 times 1 is 1, plus the 100% interest. And since interest was compounded once over the course of that one year, it would be raised to the power of 1. This is 1 times 1 plus 1, or 2. So in this calculation, this is the original $1, this is preserving that original amount, this is the interest, and this is the number of times it was compounded. Now, this calculation changes a bit if n is 2 and we're compounding interest semi-annually. In this case, after one year, the amount in the account looks like this. There's the original $1 multiplied by 1 to preserve that original amount. Remember, the interest rate is 100%, but now that we're compounding twice per year, we need to cut that 100% by 2, so we're cutting it in half. And this is raised to the power of 2, the number of times that interest is calculated each year. This is equal to 2.25. By the way, this 1.00, that is just 1. I could write it as simply 1. I'm choosing to write it like this, just so that visually it looks a bit more like the interest rate, because that's what it is. We could also compound interest quarterly, 4 times per year. Interest could even be compounded monthly, so n is equal to 12. In this case, the amount in the account after one year is about 2.6130. Notice as n, the number of times the interest is compounded per year, gets bigger, the amount of money in the account is increasing. This raises the natural question of what happens to the amount in the account as the compounding frequency n goes to infinity. Make sure you note how this is the expression we've been dealing with just with n in place of a definitive number. And as it turns out, as n gets arbitrarily large, approaching infinity, this value, in fact, does not get arbitrarily large, even though we see the amount is growing as n gets bigger, it's going to approach that number that we call E. And this is in fact one way that the number E is defined. It's defined to be the limit of this expression as n goes to infinity. The limit just meaning that E is the number this gets closer and closer to as n gets bigger and bigger. Now seeing the definition of E, you may already recognize some similarity with Richard Sabe's pan-digital approximation. This is in fact just the expression from the limit definition of E, it's just a little bit hard to see because of how it's 
written. So let's do some rewriting to see how this, in fact, has the form 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n. And note, because of how e is defined, when n gets really, really big, this expression is going to be a really, really good approximation of e. You can see for these smaller n values, the numbers are not super close to e. But if we plugged in n equals 1000, for example, we'd have ourselves a pretty good approximation. All right, now for the rewriting. Notice that this nine has a negative exponent. So we're going to make the exponent positive by putting this thing in the denominator. We thus rewrite the expression as one plus one over nine to the power of now positive four because it's in the denominator and seven times six. Let's do that multiplication. That's 42. So nine to the power of four to the power of 42. And this whole thing is being raised to the power of three to the two to the 85. So looking at this exponent, this says we have 85 factors of two in the exponent of three. If we take one of those factors of two and apply it to three now, then we can rewrite this exponent as nine to the power of two, now to the power of 84. Three squared is nine, so now we have one less factor of two. Remember, we're just trying to make this look like this and hopefully find that it's really just this expression from the definition of e. Now we have common bases of nine and we're almost there. 84 is the same as two times 42. Now, if we rewrite it like that, we see that we could raise two to the power of two to make this four to the power of 42. And thus this exponent would be rewritten as nine to the power of two squared is four. And we still have that 42 in the exponent. And there we go. It's a perfect match. Finishing the rewriting then, we've shown that Richard Sabe's approximation for E is this one plus one over nine to the power of four to the power of 42 to the power of nine to the power of four to the power of 42. So there's no computation necessary. Yes, of course, this is a fantastic approximation of E because E is the limit of this expression as N gets arbitrarily large. And this is this expression with N being very, very large. The approximation is clever. Richard Sabe found a way to take all of the digits and sneak in some massive numbers into this expression in the definition of E. But when you get down to it, that's all that's going on. It's the definition of E, but instead of taking the limit as n goes to infinity, we just got a really big n plugged in there, which gives us a great approximation. There is one other way we could approach this problem of verifying that Richard Sabe's approximation of E is good. And that's to consider the natural log function. That's a function defined so that when we plug E in, we get one. That means if Richard Sabe's approximation is good, then plugging it into the natural log function should produce something really, really close to one. One very important rule of logarithms that we'll need is the fact that we can take an exponent on the inside out as a factor. The natural log of a to the power of b, we can take that power out as a factor and write this as b times the natural log of a. So we're going to take the natural log of Richard Sabe's approximation. Note the approximation has this power, so we're going to take that power out as a factor. So when we take the natural log, this is what we get. This exponent, which we've already shown is the same as nine to the four to the 42, we've taken that out as a factor. So we have nine to the four to the 42 out here as a factor times the natural log of one plus this, which is this. It will be convenient so we don't have to keep writing nine to the four to the 42 to just give it a name. Let's say we call that number K. So let K equal nine to the power four to the power 42. Then this value should be very close to one, but how do we show that's the case? Well, if you know your calculus, you might think to consider the power series for the natural log of one plus X. Indeed, for any value of X between negative one and positive one, the natural log of one plus X is equal to this infinite sum called a power series because each of its terms are powers of X. In our case, we have this power that we brought out as a factor and then the natural log of one 
plus this number, which is definitely between negative one and positive one. Now, how do we use the power series to show that this expression is close to one? Well, what we have with this expression is this number that we're calling k multiplied by the natural log of one plus one over k. And we know from the power series for the natural log of one plus x that this is equal to k, that factor of k, multiplied by the power series for the natural log of one plus x with one over k plugged in for x. Now in this power series, the first term x would just be that one over k. So this would be multiplied by one over k. If we imagine stopping right there at the first term, we might call the rest of the series the remainder. So we'll wrap that all up into a single letter. We'll call that r. The natural log of one plus x with x equal to one over k is this. One over k, that first term, plus the remaining terms, which we'll say add up to r. Again, we want this to be close to one. If we distribute k, what we get is k times one over k, which is one, plus k times r. The question then is how big is the remainder r? We have here one plus kr, so we would like k times r to be very small. But if the remainder is quite large, then it could be that this is not close to one at all, because it could be one plus some big number. But in fact, this remainder r is definitely very small. And we know that because of what's called the alternating series estimation theorem. Note how the series for ln of one plus x is alternating. We're plugging in a positive number. So it starts positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. So this is an alternating series. In this situation where we have a series whose terms are alternating sign and disregarding the negative signs, each term of the series is less than or equal to the previous one. And in total, the terms are approaching zero. Then we know in fact, that the magnitude of a particular remainder is no more than the subsequent term. That is the first term, which was left off. This Sn represents a partial sum. This S represents the whole sum. So in our case, we're talking about a very short partial sum, just taking the first term that would make this S1. And the theorem tells us that in our situation, the remainder can be no more than the very next term, the first term that we excluded. The first term that we excluded is x squared over two. And per the theorem, we're disregarding the negative here. This means that kr, which is measuring how far off one we are, kr's magnitude, which is equal to k times the magnitude of r, because k is positive, this number must be less than or equal to k times x squared over two. In our case, remember x is one over k. So this would be then k times one over k squared over two or one over two k squared. This of course is equal to one over two k since a factor of k would cancel out. So if we take the natural log of Richard Sabe's approximation for e, is it close to one? Well, it's off by this much, one over two to the power of k. How much is this? It's extraordinarily small. We know that of course, because it's one divided by two times k, and k is this gargantuan number. So yes, it's extremely close to one. This error is really, really small. Since the natural log of Richard Sabe's approximation is this close to one, it's not hard to believe that it would be accurate to this many decimal places. So is this the coolest approximation for E? I'm not sure. I think the fact that it's so plainly just the definition of E in action at once makes it both less cool, but also more elegant. It also gains some coolness in the fact that it's pan digital and that it's just such a great approximation. But again, of course, it's such a great approximation. Anyways, let me know what your favorite approximation of E is in the comments. I'll leave relevant links in the description to original blog posts and discussions about Richard Sabe's approximation as well. And be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm a
table I'm feeling hard to keep a cable cut and untucked the table If Texas Instruments don't reply well, I think this time it might be fatal I Wish to sell my own fake cause I'm jaded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull a brain Push it all the way through the whole blue planet faded Psychosomatic habits why you so so